Good day. My name is Ralph Ullman. I'm the blacksmith here at Fort Gaines. Our blacksmith shops uh, was used here to repair and build different types of tools and hardware. This was not an ammunition or weapon shop, but a place where they would have fixed axes, shovels, rakes, picks, different types of carpenter's tools, uh, mason's tools, fixed wagons, wagon wheels, mended chains, did hinges and door pulls and latches and locks and the many other items we get from hardware stores today. Some of the tools that we use are drill presses that make holes. I'll be using a vise to hold my work. Hammers are what I shape with. An anvil is what I shape on. <coughs> Coal is what we see and smell burning. The handle I'll be pulling on is attached to a set of airbags we call a bellows. Blows air through the fire from underneath, right through the center of the fire. Helps to increase the temperatures right close to 3,500 degrees. Steel is the metal that I work with. As it heats up or increases in temperature, it changes colors. I use those colors to know what temperature it is. Right now we're about 1,500 degrees. Hot, but not hot enough. We're looking for closer to about 2,000 degrees. Give us a minute's worth of work time. What we'll do first, a real simple project, but very important then and today, and it's nail making. So slow to do in this fashion, they burn down old houses, barns, and other buildings to get nails and other metal items back to use them again. And this is how it goes. Hammering, turning back and forth will compress the steel. It makes it smaller, but makes it stronger. When I have hammered it to the length and size that I need, I'll place it on top of that chisel, make a cut where it will break off easily on the next heat so we can form its head. This will be steps one and two. So placed on the chisel, and we have the start of our nail. So nothing fancy at this point. If nail making was your job in the shop, instead of using one bar, use at least two. So while you're working one, the other one can be getting hot. Done that way, it said they could average about a nail a minute. Nails were usually made by the apprentices in the blacksmith shop, the young people that's learning how to do this. In early blacksmith shops, the average age for an apprentice was right around 10 years old. So I put the nail into the nail header, I bend it back and forth and where it's cut, it'll break. And then I form the head. And what I like to do just for fun is I put little smiley faces in my nails. A couple of dots for eyes. Give it a smile. And cool it off. So now it can be touched without getting burned. A quick straightening. and we have made one nail. So you can imagine how long it took to make enough nails to build something. It's a very slow process. <laughs> so this will be the first of our demonstrations. I want to set that right there. The next demonstration we're going to do is simple itself as well, but was another common piece of early hardware, and it's called an S-hook. It's an S-shaped hook. You would have found these quite often hanging around campfires and fireplaces to hang pots on for cooking. I'm also going to show you what different parts of the anvil is for. <coughs> we got two shaped horns. We got a cone shaped horn and a square horn. The cone shaped one is for bending circles. The square side is for bending squares.
So each part of an anvil is a usable tool. Knowing how to use those tools makes your job much simpler. The first thing we do is make a little bit of decoration on the end of the hook and we do that with a scroll. Just simply tap it around into a little circle and instead of a square cut end, we will have a little bit of decoration. Now we're going to start to bend the hook. Now what I'm showing you here today is the making of items from bar stocks. During the day of the blacksmith, or when the blacksmith shops were highly needed, a big part of your day wasn't just building new stuff, but fixing lots of broken things. So a big part of a blacksmith's job is fixing broken items. They're part mechanic as well. We have bent a hook on one end of the bar. Now we're going to bend a hook on the other end, going in the opposite direction. It'll be S-shaped, hence its name, S-hook. An average apprenticeship lasted four years. Usually apprenticeships were worked out between the person that wants to learn the job and the person that's willing to teach it. There's no set time limit involved with that, but usually a verbal agreement between the two parties. made a simple S-hook. <laughs> now this one's a little bit on the small side. They would have made them in different sizes and you would want them in different sizes because not all pots are the same length and what you do is you'd link these together and bring pots closer to or further away from the fire depending on how hot you wanted it or how hot you didn't want it. And we'll just set the little S-hook right there. Now the next thing I like to do is throw in a little bit of modern smithing and what I mean by that instead of doing something tool and hardware related we're going to make something decorative what I'm going to do with a horseshoe on one end of the horseshoe we're going to make a horse's head and on the other end we're going to make its tail I call it horse in a shoe and I like to do this little project because Television would have everybody think that blacksmiths shoe horses. And blacksmiths do not shoe horses, or while you're blacksmithing or making the shoes, you're being a smith. While you're putting them on a horse, you're being a farrier. So it's two different jobs. You can do both jobs, but each have a different title. The word smith and blacksmith and other types of smiths is from the word smite, that means to strike or to hit. The material I work with, iron and steel, once worked and cooled turns black in color, hence the term, we're blacksmiths. Other types of smiths would be gunsmiths, bladesmiths, locksmiths, uh, tinsmiths, gold, silver, coppersmiths. They all work in the field of metal, but specialize in their individual jobs. Today, just in the field of blacksmithing, there is over 2,000 types of steel. So that's a lot of metals to get familiar with. It would be real hard for somebody to be able to do all the types of smithing, smithing really well. So we specialize in our jobs. They did then, we still do today. We're going to start by forming the horse's head. I'll switch hammers from time to time. Each of the hammers I use have a flat side we call the hammer's face, and a shaped side we call the hammer's peen. The peens on the hammers 
can be used to make the different shapes in the metal. And so this pin is round, we call it a rounding pin. This is the pin that most people have heard of, it's a ball pin. And the one that I use most of the time we call a cross pin. <laughs> Alright, so that's the next step in forming the horse's head. Now with this next heat, the head will be bent over. We will cut in an ear and hammer in the mane. This will be one of the times where we need the vise. Now if I'm not careful, leaving the steel in the fire for too long, it can burn. The steel that I use will burn at about 2400 degrees. The temperature I fire, you remember, is around 3500. So left in there just a little too long and you will ruin the steel from overheating. So we've bent it over. We're going to cut in its ear. Using the peen of the hammer, I form the main. And that's our next step. <laughs> we start to get the horse head shape. Now with this heat, we're going to add in the eye, eyebrow, and the eyelashes. Since it's a decoration, you want to make it as decorative as possible. It doesn't really have a job to do. So with just an extra heat and a few different punches and chisels, we can put in the rest of its face. We'll set the eye first, we'll set the eyebrow, and then a few eyelashes. <laughs> and so the horse head side of it is complete. Now the other end that I've already hammered to a point is what I'm going to use to make the tail from. The reason why I start the project before the demonstration is because when starting from scratch to finished horse on a shoe takes about 30 minutes. So by doing that little bit of grunt work, we take about 15 minutes away. It makes it a little quicker to do. I got time to show it till you start to finish. Back to the peen of the hammer, putting the lines in it to give it a texture. Looks like a little bit of hair. Now we bend the tail over as well.
Then we only have one more heat to go. So right now it's a little bit misformed because the horse head is leaning way out to one side and the other end is curled in. I'm going to take one more extra heat and bring this side to the center and bend it back into more of a horseshoe shape. It'll look nicer. Now the Iron Age is believed, and this is the way the theory has it, to be approximately 4,000 years old. We're going to cool off the head. That way when I hammer on it, I don't smash it. we have a complete horse on a shoe. Now let's cool this off. Now you always got to remember, just because it's not glowing, don't mean it's not hot. The first color that looks hot is a real dark orange. That's right around a thousand degrees. And so if you don't want to get burned, you want to make sure that it's not hot by cooling it off in water. And we have the little horse on the shoe. Right here is where I do a, just a little bit of explaining about iron and steel. All right. The beginning of the iron and steel working process starts off with iron ore, or better stated iron oxide. Now at about that 4,000 year mark, we believe that somebody <laughs> stumbled across the idea or the thought if we get iron oxide hot enough, and we know today right around 3,000 degrees, can continue that temperature for about two to three hours, control how much oxygen can get to it, a thermal chemical change will take place. When it does, we form the element iron ferrite. So in this form, it is Fe on your periodic table. And this is what we call, or referred to as wrought iron. To the blacksmith, it describes as close to 100% pure iron as humanly possible. To make it steel, and remember we've already said that it take, there's over 2,000 types of steel. What we mix into the iron will depend on the steel that you've created. What do you want the steel to do? Uh, if we can make a steel specifically for making hammers, it will be a better hammer than using a general purpose steel. So what steel is, anything mixed into iron above 0.2 of a percent is then considered a type of steel. <laughs> now there was one thing that we haven't talked about yet that's real important and I didn't do to these pieces that I made, and that is to protect it from oxidation. When you see iron and steel turn orange, it's when the oxygen that makes up part of our air, part of water, bonds with the iron and the steel. It is in a slow, steady process of changing back to the form we found it in. So to slow that oxidation down, we paint stuff, we oil it, we put waxes on it, um, we use other metals to cover it up, like we chrome plate or galvanize something, all in an attempt to slow down rusting. To this point, we have not invented rust proof, so maybe somewhere down the line they may, but the um, chances of keeping oxygen away from the surface forever is just not real good. So more than likely we will come up with finishes that will last longer, 
but to make it rust proof, my personal opinion is I just don't think we'll ever get there. All right, and I'll take questions at this point. When I bring it out, I'm going to bring it to here, brush it off, put my touch mark in it, but where I'm going to do the seasoning is right here which is in this bucket. Is that beeswax? Beeswax. Yeah, I'll get a big piece of it. This is just a big piece of beeswax. It is the hive of a honeybee. Um, if you're familiar, I've ever, ever heard about the term seasoning a cast iron pan. Yes. I'm going to season that. But instead of using oil, I'm going to use beeswax. I got to bring it all the way back to temperature from cold, so it's going to take an extra minute or so. But the horseshoe thing started because so many people from watching television westerns and stuff all would got the same mis in um, uh, information that I did as well that blacksmiths spent most of their time shoeing horses. And they really didn't. Back in the day, so to speak, <laughs> you would have had somebody in a shop shoeing horses, somebody in a shop making horseshoes, somebody in a shop making horseshoe nails. That way you could get a whole lot more horses shooting in a day than one person having to do it all. And each of those jobs had different terminologies to their titles. Now as time goes on, the Industrial Revolution causes the small shop to start to have to lay people off. They don't have as much work to go around and the blacksmith starts to do more and more of all of it themselves. And so that's kind of how the apprentice blacksmith got started. It was from a, a lack of all the work that they used to do. Namely, all the tools and hardware that everybody used to make their lives and jobs simpler. That was the main job of the blacksmith. The blacksmith was always considered more like the, the jack in the trade. Could do a lot of different stuff, but specialized especially mostly in the, in the tools and hardware, hardware related items. Everything that I make that I can fit it on, I set my mark. It identifies that I was the smith that made it. So this is going to stick around longer than I am. So years down the road, that mark will be able to be referenced to a time period in a place. Cut off a little bit of the sharp edges with a file. Give it a good brushing. And last but not least, is to apply the finish. This finish we apply hot, beeswax in the bucket, horseshoe four or five hundred degrees. Just set it down in there, sometimes it catches fire. And what's happening, the steel being hot, you heat it up, it expands, opens up the pores. So the wax, or you can use oil, will fill those pores up. As it cools, the pores close traps the wax or oils into the, to the surface and it is then seasoned. Compared to painting, which just gets on the surface, this is a subsurface finish, so it lasts longer. And that's the finish we want to use. We want it to not rust as long as we can get away with it. 
And so this is the same in a bucket. This is just a loose piece of beeswax. What's in the bucket is burnt and black, and I just use the new, new be beeswax to get off that burnt beeswax. It just makes a nicer looking finish. Give it a good shake. And then I hang it up and let it cool off. And when it's finished cooling off, it'll look similar to this one.